Um, we're going to look today at the, uh, uh, the kingdom. We're in our kingdom series. And today we're going to look at uh, uh, the nation of Israel. Any discussion about the kingdom has got to include modern day Israel, doesn't it? Um, what does the Bible say about Israel? How do, we, how do we interpret it? How do we understand it through the lens of uh, biblical prophecy, through God's promises, um, the words of Jesus? It's complicated, and part of the challenge of it is the Bible is not explicit. The Bible doesn't say, here's what's going to happen, and here's how Israel plays. And there's lots of different ideas about it, and probably we won't all agree on them. But we need to really reflect on it and do it in a serious way, because what we believe about Israel and the kingdom will we'll largely um, inform how we, how we view some of the challenges in the Near East. As you know, the, the, that's one of, the, one of the most problematic uh, areas of the world is, is Palestine and Israel and the borders. You know, decades of violence has, has just made it a really complicated place. And, and so then sometimes we, we see it from a certain perspective based on our theological um, bent. And so we need, to, we need to kind of look at it from a... a Serious perspective and make sure that we're seeing it with God's view. Sometimes we have to step back and take the, the, the bird's eye view of it, if you will, and see the whole narrative of God's redemptive purposes. And so we're going to do some of that today. Um, it's not my goal here today to try to convince you of a certain perspective. I'm going to present mine, and it may be different from yours, but there are some things that we need to consider with, with great seriousness and the implication that it has, not only for people of that region, but for also people of faith as well. So... Let's, uh, let's pray together and, and uh, see if we can learn something uh, more about the kingdom. Lord, thank you for today, and I thank you for uh, your presence in our midst. Your word tells us that when we're gathered in your name, that you're here with us. The word tells us that you inhabit our praise, so we are gathered in your name. We've sung your praises, O God. We've, we've uh, declared the truths of your kingdom through song. And so, Lord, we, we acknowledge your presence in our midst, and we're grateful for it. Lord, move us by your spirit. Help us to become more and more the people, the men, the women that you've called us to be. Uh, I'm grateful for your. I'm grateful for the body, the, the the body of Christ, the church. I'm grateful for your people. So, I pray, oh God, that you would be with us today as we uh, consider some challenging aspects of your word that we want to do all that we can to frame up in a way of humility and grace, uh, but also great wisdom and compassion. And um, I, we we need your spirit for that. We can't. We can't discern these things without, um, without your wisdom. And uh, so forgive us, Lord, where we've missed it. Forgive us, Lord, where we haven't loved as we should. Forgive us where we haven't always acknowledged uh, your plan. And we've, we've sometimes, um, we sometimes missed opportunities to be your image bearers. And yet we know that you extend grace and every day is a new day for us. And so we walk in that grace, we love in that grace, and we live in that grace. For all of these things, Lord, we're grateful. I'm grateful. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to bounce around here a bit. Um, so just try to keep up with me as well as you can. If you have Bibles, I'll try to kind of keep you posted. But we've got everything up on the screen for you today. Um, if we're going to understand the, the nation of Israel and how it plays into uh, the overall uh, plan of God's redemptive purposes, uh, we have to kind of start from the very beginning when the promise was made to Abraham. That he, you know, the command was for him to leave his family of origin and to go to a land that God was going to give him. And God made a covenant with Abraham. Uh, we find it in Genesis 15. There's actually quite a few variations of the covenant. Um, it was extended to Abraham. It was extended to Isaac. It was extended to Jacob. And this is the earliest reading of it. It says, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram before his name was changed and said to your descendants, I give you this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great, uh, the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hit. My job is hard. The Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Thank you very much. Now, one of the things to note about this is note that that the the extent of the land promised was far greater than Israel ever inhabited. Um, and that was part of the indictment of the nation of Israel is that 
they never actually fully possessed the land. They were supposed to come in, possess it, drive everybody out. But they didn't do that. They came in. They were timid. They didn't. They weren't obedient. And they never took, took full possession of the land. It's important to this discussion. So put a little tack in that idea. But the, but what's being described here is an area far exponentially greater than any land that they ever possessed. The, what we the, the greatest expansion of the nation of Israel through the reign of King Solomon was nowhere near what's promised to Abraham. So from the very beginning, they never lived up to the full expectation of God's promise. And the, and the challenge with the nation of Israel is that God, God always dealt with them as a people. So the, the promise of redemption was granted to them as a unit, as a family, as the people of God. It wasn't extended to other people. If other, if other people, if Gentiles, who, people who weren't Jewish, if they wanted to, to become part of the, the family, if they wanted to be part of the people of God, they wanted to enter into covenant, they did it through a ritual of baptism, of, of a proselyte baptism, of cleansing, so that then they could be part of the Jewish covenant. And so they had to go through these rituals. But it's really important to note that at this time in human history, redemption came through the, the covenant made with Abraham. Abraham's life happened about 2,000 years before Jesus was born. Um, it was extended to his son Isaac. Isaac was the son of blessing, the son of promise. And then to uh, Isaac's son Jacob. Jacob, whose name would later be changed to Israel, which is where the nation of Israel comes from. So these are called the patriarchs. And this is a promise that was made. And he dealt with them as a family, as a people. The salvation wasn't extended to other people. It was only through the nation of Israel that salvation was to come. Now, Jesus came and he began to speak of a little different, taking a different aspect of it. Instead of dealing with them as a people, he would be, salvation now was dealt with on an individual basis. We received it by faith, which is why when he came in and began to talk about baptism, it was so controversial. The Jewish people would say, why are you talking to us about baptism? We're Jewish. We don't need to be baptized. We don't need to go through these rituals of purification. But Jesus is saying, yes, you do, because I'm calling out a new people. We're going to see more of that. It was controversial. It was challenging to them. They're not the ones that had to seek another path to salvation. They already had it. It was because they were Jewish. At one point, John the Baptist said, I don't care about that. I could make sons of Abraham of these stones. Your Jewishness means nothing. So, so Jesus began to speak of a different, uh, of, a, of an individualized. He began to deal with people in terms of faith. He told Nicodemus, you have to be born again. You have, he, and, and Nicodemus didn't get it. He says, do I got to enter into my mother's birth canal again and go through that all over? And Jesus says, well, if that works, work. If that's how you'll understand it, fine. You have to be born again. It's 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 controversial. It's it's counterintuitive. It's something that we how do I go back and how am I reborn? I've already been there. I've already done that. But it but it speaks of the Jesus will talk about, you know, the violence of the kingdom. It's taken by violent men. In other words, it's unnatural to us. It's it's in the same way that that birth is is sort of a. Uh, a, a violent, bloody event. It's hard. It's difficult. New birth is the same way. It's something that we have to take possession of. It's not for the timid. The kingdom, a few weeks ago, we looked at that. We don't, we don't sort of ease into the kingdom like we ease into, uh, you know, a warm bath water. It's, it's more like a jump into a frozen Minnesota lake. You just go for it. You got to jump in and break through the ice and it takes your breath away. It's violent, it's hard, you have to commit to doing it. This is what the kingdom is about. Jesus began to say it's controversial, it's hard, we're not dealing with families anymore. In fact, he says, for I have come to turn man against father, daughter against mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Well, that's actually not all that unbelievable. <laughs> for a man's enemies will be members of his own household. In other words, now this is controversial, I'm dividing people up based on your individual faith. Instead of Instead of him saying, I'm taking the whole community, now it's based on your faith. The internal work of the Spirit. It's what theologians call the internal witness of the Spirit. When somebody has tasted and seen that the Lord is good, when they've experienced the fullness of God, you never have to worry about them if they're saved or not. They know they are saved because they've tasted God. They've experienced Him in His fullness. But God does that on an individual basis. And now He deals with us on an individual basis. It doesn't mean, by the way... That is completely an individualistic response. 
he still deals with this as the people of God. He still deals with this as the church. It's kind of this divine mystery of what the church is and who the spirit is and how we're uh, all called to be the bride of Christ. And yet, as we all know, my salvation is based on my my belief in him, the acceptance of all of the promises made in Scripture. So he says, now I'm dealing with you on an individual basis. And yet that the gospel still was extended initially to the Jewish people. I actually had a a young guy in my office I was talking to about this. And this is actually in some of the rhetoric that you'll find in different Islamic websites and stuff that will say, see, this is proof that Jesus is not the Messiah. He only came to his own people. And I said, you know, it's absolutely right. It's actually what the Bible says. The, the, the gospel was initially made, the presentation was initially made to the Jewish people. When Jesus sent out his disciples, here's what he told them, his 12, the 12, he sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any towns of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. To a Canaanite woman, he, he sent this mild rebuke. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. So the presentation to receive and to believe in the Messiah based on your individual faith was extended to the to the, the people of Israel initially. And and this was this was part of the as, as the gospel was even spread through Peter. He took it first to the we studied this when we looked at Acts. He took it first to the, the Jewish people and then it expanded to the Gentiles. Paul, whenever he would go into a new city, would start with the synagogues. And then he, if, if, they, if they received it great, if they didn't, he would go into other uh, venues and, and, and take it to the Gentiles. One of the big challenges of the first century church was sort of taking it out of the Gentile perspective or the, the Jewish perspective and extending it to the whole Gentile population. The gospel was first presented to the Jewish people, but they rejected it. They didn't believe in it. They, they saw, for the Jewish people, they would see Messiah in one of two ways. They would understand him as being uh, a great conquering king, sort of after the, the, the image and the lineage of David. David was the great conquering king of their, of their culture and the region. So they were looking for another great deliverer like David, or they were looking for um, a messianic, uh, eschatological fulfillment of all the promises, as we see in Daniel 7. The Son of Man, descending from on high, is going to make everything right to, to, to uh, establish and inaugurate the kingdom. It's one of the prophecies that we look to in understanding uh, what's going to happen in end times. But they would see Messiah in one of those two ways, but Jesus didn't come in either one of those ways, did he? He didn't come as a great conquering hero, a great conquering king. He came to poverty. He came to a small family. He came to a small town. He came to a small uh, 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 building, a, a little barn, probably a cave. He didn't come with any of the grandiosity that maybe we would expect the great Messiah. And even as he called himself the son of man, pulling from some of the, 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 the language of Messiah from the Old Testament, from Daniel, it wasn't the son of man coming and ascending and, and, and bringing everything around. It was sort of as a representative of mankind in simplicity. Sort of like saying, I'm, I'm like an everyman. I'm one of you. He entered into our world, which is why his favorite, uh, his favorite terminology for himself was the son of man. I'm one of you. So he didn't come the way people expected him to come. He certainly didn't come the way his culture expected him to come. And he certainly didn't come the way his disciples thought Messiah should come. Which is what makes um, uh, all of it so incredible. There's this division There's this division in the mind of Christ as he's he's explaining it from the time of John the Baptist to the 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 law and the prophets, the time of John and then the, the advent of Jesus and the church. There's this there's this line in history. He writes about it or he speaks about it in Matthew 11. This is Jesus speaking. He says, truly, I tell you, among those born of woman, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the great herald, the messenger that came right before Jesus, proclaiming that he's the Messiah. He's, he's telling his generation. He says, John the Baptist was the great, yet whoever is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is also the message of Hebrews saying all of the great patriarchs, all of the great heroes of faith, they were great. But the smallest in the kingdom is the is greater than them. It's a it's it's an amazing statement about who we are as people of faith. There's this line drawn. Everything's different now. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It's 
It's about people who are willing to grab hold of it. Enter through the, the birth, cal- birth canal again to be rebirthed. It's unnatural. It's something we resist. We don't want to do it. It's, it's counterintuitive. But the kingdom is not for the faint of heart. The kingdom is not for people who are double-minded. I told one young man, you have to possess it. We can, we can follow a thousand rabbit trails of doubt and question a million things. There comes a time when you put your hand to the plow and you move forward. We need more of that today. Too much double-mindedness. Too much lukewarm living. Violent people. In other words, we take it. We take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. This is that same context, Matthew 11. And if you're willing to accept it, he is the, he is the Elijah who was to come. Elijah was a great prophet. The great prophets tend to come with a powerful message from God. And this is one of the benchmark times in Israel's history. Whoever has ears, let him hear it. So, so Jesus is comparing John the Baptist to Elijah. He says he's the new Elijah. To what can I compare this generation, he continues. They're like children sitting out in the marketplace and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you. You didn't dance. We sang a dirge. You didn't mourn. Like little children saying, why won't you dance to our music? Why won't you play? And and Jesus saying, you're like little kids. Nothing satisfies you. For John came eating or drinking and they said he has a demon or or neither eating or drinking. So John was a pretty, he was a pretty austere guy. He had a message of repentance. He says, he's coming like this and, and you're saying, well, he's got a demon. He's too sober. He's too somber. The message of repentance doesn't doesn't hit us the way we want to. But Jesus, on the other hand, came eating and drinking. And they said he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So it's what you want. You're not happy with the message of forgiveness and your, or the message of repentance. And you're not happy with the message of grace. In other words, they didn't want to hear it. Why? Because they were Jewish. Salvation came through them. They were the fulfillment of God's covenant. But wisdom is proved by her deeds. Then Jesus began to denounce the times or the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. They were unwilling to look at the narrative of God's redemption through the lens of personal faith. I'm not saved because I believe in the claims of the gospel. I'm saved because I'm Jewish. God made a promise with me. So things begin to shift. Jesus' message now becomes about one of rejection of the, 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 the Jewish people. Both they reject him and he rejects them. Sort of the, it's one of the great tragedies of, of, of the narrative of redemption. So it's, it's like a divorce when, when the, the, the two people reject one another. The, the, uh, the prophets write a lot about it. They didn't repent. He rejects them. So when he's speaking to his disciples, there's great question as to who Jesus is. He's doing these remarkable things. People want to make him king. In fact, at one point, one of the most notable things that Jesus does is he takes a little boy's lunch. You remember the story. And he 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 miraculously multiplies it. He feeds 5000 men, probably 15000 people. They want to make him king. How I mean. The first one of the, one of the most problematic things in the world is to keep an army fed and maintained. So if you've got a guy that can turn a little bit of food into a whole bunch of food and, and feed 15,000 people, boy, you're halfway there already, aren't you? We need to make this guy king. He's got some figured out. He will build a great big army. It'll be well provided. We'll drive out the Romans. It'll be great. Jesus said, no, that's not my kingdom. In this same different series, in the same different context, He's talking, or a similar context, he's talking to his disciples. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? This is when Jesus is at the peak of his ministry, and there's all kinds of people reflecting, who is this Jesus? Who Who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He says, but what do you, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Then Peter answers, says, you are the Messiah or the Christ, the son of the living God. This is often lost on us, the impact of this. Peter and the other disciples, these young men, they would not have seen Jesus in the way that we see him now. 
what Peter is saying. He's saying you're not the Messiah in fulfillment of it as it exists in my mind. His confession is that everything I know about the Christ has been wrong. Everything I thought about my nationalism, everything I thought about my, the redemptive purposes of God has been wrong. We tend to look at him as saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It should probably be read more like this. You're the Christ. The Messiah. The son of the living God. It would have been so counter to everything Peter knew. Everything. Here's what Jesus says to him. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. By the way, that was true 2000 years ago and it's still true today. You simply cannot believe it and receive it and understand it without God's intervention. You can't. It is only by the revelation of the Spirit. It was true with Peter, and it's true with us. And I tell you, Jesus continues, that you are Peter. He changes his name. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. A lot of different ideas of what he's meaning. Does he mean as... You know, as Luther, Luther and Calvin had different ideas. Was it the statement? Was it the statement? Was it the fundamental truth that he's the Christ, that he's going to build his church? Is it the representation of Peter as an apostle, representing the, the, the apostles and the prophets? It certainly squares with what, with what Paul said, that the kingdom is built on the foundations laid by the apostles and the prophets. Is this sort of a foundational aspect of it? Our Catholic friends would believe that he was the first father, the first pope, and He's, it's sort of, they'd see it from a more institutional perspective. However we see it, I think this is what we have to understand, that it is both the truth of what Peter is saying and the person of Peter being, being the first stone that's placed. I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's an office, but he's saying, Peter, this is how I'm going to build it. I'm going to build it one life at a time. Note it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a national thing. He says it's one life at a time. It's one living stone. And Peter, I'm putting you in place first. And now Jesus, for 2,000 years, is putting these stones in place. I'm a living stone. Hector's a living stone. Ken's a living stone. We're all living stones. Now, together we make up a family of God. We make up a people. We make up his body. But I'm, I receive it by my individual faith, the, the, the reality of the Spirit living in me. Peter, Jesus is saying, this is how I'm going to build my church. And the, tr- the word church there is a real interesting one. It comes from a Greek word that's used to describe the people of Israel. The, the Bible was translated about 300 years before Jesus came to earth. The, the, the Jewish Bible or the Old Testament was translated um, by, by Hebrew scholars from, from Hebrew, from ancient Hebrew into Greek. Greek would have been the, the known language of the time. It was the language of academics. It was the language of study. So it would, it, it would be natural for Jewish academics to say we need to have a translation in Greek. So they translated it from, from Hebrew into Greek. And, and the word that Jesus uses here is the, when, when the translators brought it into our English version, they kept that word. It was the word used to describe Israel. A very different idea from what we have when we think of church. It carries with it the idea of my people. So in a sense, Jesus is saying, I'm going to build my people and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. What he's saying is profound. What he's saying is there's a new way that I'm dealing with people. I'm calling to myself a new people. It's no longer based on the merit of their nationality. I'm building a new thing. Now, this has led to people thinking different things about about Israel. Some theologians have have used what's called replacement theology, that the church replaces Israel. I don't really think that's accurate. The fact of the matter, it wasn't really the church. It's Jesus that did that. It's Jesus that fulfills the purposes of Israel. Israel was to be the light of the world. 
Jesus says, you weren't the light to the world. You put your light under a basket, under a bushel. They were supposed to, supposed to be the salt of the earth. They were supposed to make the world a better place. Jesus says, you didn't do that. Now Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the goodness of the world. I'm the wisdom of God. The things that were supposed to be the nation of Israel, I'm fulfilling. Which is why I said, I'm not, I didn't come to do away with the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill them. The things that the people of Israel could not do, Jesus says, I did those things. I fulfilled Israel's destiny. So there's not really a, a replacement theology. What it is is saying, Jesus fulfilled the purposes that Israel could not. Jesus' language would go stronger as he neared his death. Oh, let's continue with this idea here. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom whenever, of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We've talked about this before, but it's profound. At one point, Jesus talked to, talking to the Pharisees and the scribes. He says, you're keeping the truth from the people. You're keeping them in bondage. You're supposed, with your words, what's been entrusted to you, you're supposed to set them free. But you're not, you're holding them in bondage. At another point, he said, the, 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 the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they're getting into the kingdom before you do because you're actually blocking the door from them. So I'm removing you. So what he's saying, he says, I'm taking the authority of the gospel that was entrusted to the Jewish people, entrusted to the scribes and the Pharisees. I'm taking it from you and I'm handing it to these young men, to Peter, to John. To the other twelve. To us. Think of how profound the keepers of the law, the keepers of the prophets, the ones that held the keys to the kingdom. Jesus says, give me that. I'm giving it to these guys. In other words, entrance to the kingdom. Get this. Entrance to the kingdom was no longer entrusted to the leaders of the Jewish people. Because they blocked people from it. This is why Jesus says, take on my yoke. My yoke is light. The yoke that the Pharisees were placing on people was heavy, was burdensome. Jesus says, I'm taking this away from you and I'm giving the keys to the kingdom to these young men who then will in turn give it to the church and to the world. And the things that we loose on earth, if, if we if here in our, in our lives, in our church, in our neighborhoods, if we set people free they are set free in heaven. But if we disregard them, if we ignore their pain, if we ignore their peril, and we keep them in bondage, we don't set them free, they are bound in heaven. In other words, the things that we do here matters. You cannot sit passively and just say, well, things are going to wind down at some point. I put my hand up and I receive Jesus. That's not the kingdom. The kingdom is for people who will possess it by faith. Violently, take that, that's mine. This little baby grabbing a sucker and saying, this is mine. We take it violently. There's no room for passivity in the kingdom. This was Jesus' very clear instruction. The things that we do here matter. That's why Jesus used strong language. If we set a person free, we set them free for eternity. If we ignore their peril, if we leave them in their bondage, they're bound for eternity. We need to let that sink into the deepest places of our heart. Jesus is removing authority from the scribes and the Pharisees, and he's giving it to his church, his people, a new people. His language would get more and more controversial, which is why people began to reject him. They wanted to make him king. He'd say things like, man, I made me king. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. People said, weird. I'm going to do that. They began to turn from him. And his language got stronger and stronger. He said, listen to another parable. This is right before he died. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a wine press in it. He built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. The guy built a great vineyard. He had all the stuff in it. It's his. He rented it out. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruits. My fruit. I built it. I paid for it. It's all mine. You're just working. I want to get my share. It's my fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, stoned a third. When Jesus tells these stories, he's talking about the prophets. You ignored the prophets. You abused them. You killed them. Then he sent other servants to them. More than the first time, the tenants treated them the same way. 
Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenders saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. Let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard. This is before Jesus was killed. And they killed him. Therefore, when the owners of the vineyards comes, what will he do to these tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. They replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants. This is them responding. They knew their own judgment. Who will give them to the share of the crops at a harvest time? Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in their eyes. You rejected Messiah, but God is using this to build his church, to build his people. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Be taken away from a people or a nation. The kingdom was taken from them. Peter would identify who that people is later when he would write in his epistle. We're a holy nation. A holy priesthood. A special people. In other words, now the kingdom is built. The people are a spiritual people. A spiritual body. Not a fleshly one. The covenant made with the nation of Israel, was based on their ethnicity. It was always supposed to go beyond that. Because of the hardness of their heart, they rejected their own purpose. They didn't bear the fruit of the kingdom. Because of that, God took it away. So what does that mean for um, for the people of Israel? Um, I'm going to kind of just paraphrase it because of time. But I would encourage you to go back and read Romans 11. Here's what Paul basically says. Paul basically, Romans is written because of division in the church of Rome. Rome was not a heavily populated by Jewish people. It was, you know, it was a, a largely a Gentile area. And so the church that was planted there, Paul didn't plant it. In fact, there's no indication that he actually went there. He may have later, but we don't have an account of it. Um, but he's writing to this church in Rome. And uh, um, he's, he's writing to address a serious problem. It was a problem that faced many of the first century churches, but it's particularly strong here in Rome. And what's happening is this small group of Jewish believers are insisting that the larger group of Gentile believers need to go through uh, and need to adhere to the dietary laws and to other rituals of circumcision, things of that nature. And the Gentile believers are going... Pfft. We were never, we were never Jewish people. We were never, we were never Jewish. We're not doing that. So there's sort of this lack of respect. The the Jewish believers are insisting on it, and the and the Roman believers are going, yeah, we're not going to do that. So so Paul is saying, look, you need to have mutual respect for one another, and this is what the heartbeat of of, of Romans is all about. So we often look at Romans from a theological premise, and it's and there's a lot of good theological things in it. But Paul's main concern is to say, look, we're all sinners. So Romans 11 goes through a, a lot of detail talking about how God broke off the branches and, the, and Israel's failure to, uh, to believe and to accept by faith the gospel is our benefit. So we, we have great benefit because of their rejection because the gospel then came to us. Remember how Jesus said at first it was initially for the, for the Jewish people. They rejected, so it comes to the Gentiles. In fact, Paul said, I'm going to continue to preach because it's my hope that my own people will, pre- will be provoked to faith. They'll be envious of what you see. In other words, when we're experiencing all the fullness and the blessing of God, he's saying there's a day coming when the Jewish people are going to look with envy at what we have. That day's not here yet, is it? For the most part, while certainly there are Jewish believers, we have to concede that the Jewish people have not by and large looked at us with envy. In fact, if you look at studies and you sort of look at how Jewish people kind of look at us, they look at us very, very differently than we look at them. So he goes on to talk about the branches being broken off. And he says, look, the, 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 the branches were broken off of the tree, off of the root, the root of the gospel that was given to the Jewish people. Jesus is divine. He grows up. The branches reject him. They don't produce fruit. He breaks off the branches. So he broke off all the branches. And then the gospel now goes to the Gentiles. So what God starts doing is grabbing all these other branches and grafting them into the tree. I didn't know anything about grafting. I still don't really. 
Wikipedia taught me a little. But I, it's kind of a cool thing if you have a tree and, it, and, a, and there's a big storm that comes in and it breaks off. You can actually take that branch and you can get graphing tape and you can put it back together. And after a period of time, it'll grow back together. I didn't know that. I, I don't really know how it works. Maybe some of you that are smarter than me can figure that out. And then I guess with certain types of fruit trees, if they're similar, you can actually do some of this sort of grafting with, with different species of that fruit. So it's kind of an interesting thing. I didn't know that. And this is what he's talking about. So he's, taking, he's taking the wild branches. By the way, that's all of us. We're wild. We're Gentiles. And he's grafting it into the tree. But he says, don't get too high on your horse. If you're starting to think that you're something special, you're not. You're just a wild branch that God picked up and grafted into the tree. He can break you off just like he broke off the Jewish people. And he can grab these other branches. And he, in other words, God can graft in anything he wants to graft in. But if all of the branches are broken off, they're broken off, aren't they? And the only way for them to be unbroken off is for God to take it, whether it's a natural branch or it's an unnatural one, and graft it into the tree. In other words, for every human on planet Earth, there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ. We need to be engrafted in. And God says, look, if I grafted you in, this wild, unnatural thing, into the natural tree, it's going to be a whole lot easier for me to graft them natural branches back in. That's his whole point. And he says, man, when the day comes and there's restoration to the people of Israel, it's going to be like a resurrection from the dead. So in other words, there's something coming. For the, natural, for, for the nation of Israel, for those natural branches. But we're not there yet, are we? Does it mean that every Jewish pe person is going to be saved? I don't think that's what he means. When he talks about all, he, has, he talks about the number that God has. The elect, the, the Gentiles. He says there's, there's a number for all of the Gentiles. God knows what that number is. Just like there's a number for all of the Jewish people. God knows the number. Why is this important? Here's why this is important. If we don't understand how we come into the kingdom, it can, it can lead us to not understand our own personal destiny, and I also think misinterpret things that happen in our, in our time throughout the world. There's a school of thought called dispensationalism that a lot of us have grown up in. And the way we see it depends on how we interpret Scripture and how we view the Bible. So a dispensationalist believes in the literal translation of the Bible. So they, you actually kind of go through it, and this is what it says literally, and here's how we interpret it. And there's a couple of challenges with that. First is whereas we believe, as I believe, that the Bible, of course, is the inspired word of God. He inspires people to write it. It's still a book that's written by a person in a context to other people. It always is. So there's always a human author, somebody actually writing the words, and, it's, and they're writing to address an issue or to give a history or to write poetry, and it's addressed to another audience. So if we ignore that, we're going to miss a lot of things in the Bible. Prophecy is one of those things we can miss. If we don't understand the context, if we don't understand prophecy for what it is, we can, we can often miss it. So prophecy always has an immediate context and a future context. It, in almost every situation, it has these. So it can be difficult to say what, what is for right now and what's happening in the future and how do those all sort of come together. And so we have to, we have to recognize there's difficulty in making literal translations of some of these things, particularly in Daniel 7 and, and Revelations 20 and other passages of Revelations. It, just, it can just be a challenge. Um, so... So that's the first aspect is understanding. It's, it's the difference between interpreting the Bible literally and interpreting it literarily. In other words, as a, as a piece of literature. So we're going to read wisdom literature. We're going to read historical narrative. We're going to re read prophecy. We're going to read uh, gospels, letters that are written. We're going to read them all a little bit differently in the context in which it's written. It's called eg exegeting the text. The second problem, the second and again, it's not a problem. I'm not going to say these are like deal breakers. But the second challenge is dispensationalists tend to believe 
that each each portion of Scripture stands on its own merit. So in other words, we, we read it as it is at that moment in time, where I believe, according to Paul, is that all Scripture must be interpreted through Jesus Christ. Paul says Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. In other words, we cannot understand Scripture apart from him. We have to read it through the lens of Christ. Jesus himself did that. He said, in your law, and in this famous Sermon on the Mount, he says, in your law, here's what it says, but here's what I say. So Jesus interpreted his, his own scripture, his own nation scripture through his own lens. So in other words, when we look at scripture, we also have to look at it through the, the redemptive narrative of Christ. How does Christ factor into it? What did Christ say about these things? So if we take some of these fairly problematic and difficult passages, and we take sometimes an overly literal perspective of them, then we draw conclusions that often, in my opinion, and it might not be yours, in my opinion, that I think that are overinterpreted. So in other words, we can come down to perspectives of what's going to happen with Israel, what's going to happen with the temple, what's going to happen with the rapture, things of that nature. And there are very complex systems that basically say ethnic Israel is going to come back into its homeland and the temple is going to be rebuilt, and there's, these are going to be events that will happen before the millennium. I, my personal belief is that I believe that's an overinterpretation. I don't think those things are going to happen. Um, first of all, ethnic Israel is almost completely impossible to identify. It's, it hasn't really existed in centuries. So to say this is ethnic Israel is very problematic and, dif- and difficult. The other problematic thing is that the, the area is far too vast. So what is defined as Israel's land? What was promised was never inherited. So how can how can they then re-inhabit something that they never did inhabit? Um, it's rife with problems. Now, I'm not saying if you believe that, you're you're wrong. I'm not really saying that. I'm saying I don't, I don't believe that's the case. Um, and this was popularized by, if you've read some of Hal Lindsey's work, if you've you know, read the Left Behind series, seen the movies, kind of studied, it's taught in seminaries. So it's not really my place to say, well, here's definitively, definitively what's right and definitively what's wrong. So you may see that different. You might be going, nope, I don't believe that. I read Left Behind. That's okay. Here's what I can say. We have to concede that there are things we just don't know. But here's something we do definitively know. If I believe certain things about ethnic Israel, and I believe that ethnic Israel is going to come back and repossess their land, and they're going to rebuild the temple, then I'm going to kind of close a blind eye, close my eyes to a lot of things that are happening within Israel that are harming Palestinians, much of whom, 20% of whom, are Christian. So Christian Palestinians are caught between a rock and a hard place, between Israel's policies and an increasing, increasingly hostile environment within the Palestinian people against Christians. They're in a lose-lose situation. Now, by the way, I don't, I'm a huge fan of Israel. They are a strong ally. We need to protect them. We need to partner with them. We need to commit to uh, a long-term relationship with them. But like any friendship, we also need to hold them accountable. And some of these policies have been almost universally condemned by every, every nation on planet Earth. Even the, um, the, uh, the um, uh, Organization of Evangelicals, the, the American, Evangel- uh, American Evangelical Association, I said, no, what they're doing is wrong. Some of the some of the territorial disputes, um, whatever you believe about that. Here's the thing that we definitively have to do. We have to be deeply concerned about Palestinian Christians who are caught in the vice of Israeli policy and a hostile community. And and there used to be a very robust community, about 20 percent people, uh, Christians who've lived within a really difficult place of the world as a Christian witness for 2,000 years, from the very beginning of the church. And now they're fleeing these areas. And here's what I want to encourage you to do. Wherever you are on all of this eschatologically, we have to trust that God's going to work it out. So God doesn't bring... We've got to get this part. God doesn't bring justice around by allowing injustice. Okay, so we need to trust that God's going to do the just thing. So if God's going to rebuild the temple and God, 
I, I have concern. I don't, I have to, my own concerns about it, but if you believe that, fine. If God's going to repopulate the nation of the, the regions of Israel, fine. But He's not going to do it in, in just ways. He's going to do it in just ways. Just w- ways that consider the plight of people who are often marginalized in these situations. Jesus did say this definitively. Of all of this dialogue, here's what He did say. He says, they'll know, the world will know that we are Christians by the love that we have for one another. So we can't just ignore that plight. And one in four Christians, evangelical Christians in the United States, basically just give Israel a a free pass because that's where the temple is going to be rebuilt. They're going to repopulate that area. So anything that's done is just sort of kind of, I'm not going to say it's ignored, but it's not considered. Now, I would just encourage you to really study. There's some really cool things out there. In fact, some of the things that I that I discovered, I didn't know this. There's an increasing movement amongst Palestinian young people and and Israeli young people who are really in favor of a single state solution. Um, a, 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 double, a, a two state solution has been, you know, argued over for decades now, and we, we've never there's never been any resolution. But it's really interesting. I read scholars on the Palestinian side pro and con, and scholars on the Israeli side, pro and con. And it was really interesting. It sort of boils down to something like this. A lot of Palestinians, particularly young Palestinians, are really for a single state solution, which surprised me. I didn't know this. There's an increasing uh, enthusiasm for it because they say, look, we want sort of a Western-style democracy that allows us to worship the way we want to worship, that allows us to have freedom, to have all the amenities that that that... Uh, the Jewish people are afforded because they all share a resource. We, we see this as a benefit. And on top of that, it would bring back millions and millions of Palestinians who've left because they, they now have representation and freedom. And a lot of young Israeli people are saying the same thing. So it's going to be interesting. That's, that's something I didn't know. Here's what I would just encourage you. Do what I did and just study it. Just study it from, a, from kind of a, a human rights perspective. I think it's important. And I know sometimes I kind of wade into controversial waters every now and again. I don't think we I think we can do that without um, you know without somehow questioning our loyalty to Israel. I just think we can. I think even the best friends I have hold me accountable and I hold them accountable. So I think it's just good good friendship. Study it. In the end this isn't really about politics though. But you can't when you when you sort of look at scripture, you can't just sort of ignore the socio political aspects of it. In the end this is a spiritual thing that I think is really important. Because for dispensationalists, they believe that the church and Israel are separate. They, they believe that there's a separation and that God has this sort of special plan for Israel that he doesn't really have for the church. So we sort of take a little bit of a backseat, if I'm honest. It's sort of, you know, and it, it leads to complacency, and I've seen it. I, I've, it's, I think it's all over the church. Because if you sort of say, well, there is an end coming, but there's these other things that have to happen first, then we sort of just go, eh, I'll wait till those things happen, right? I mean, it's all over the church, so we see it all the time. So in other words, if I, boy, once Israel takes, once, you know, ethnic Jews re-inhabit the, you know, the promised land, boy, then I got to really get my act together because Jesus is coming soon. Sort of like I have this big loud truck and my kids would say, you could hear it coming from, you know, eight blocks away. And as soon as they hear the big truck coming, blah, 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 it's time to start getting everything, you know, put in order because dad's coming. If our faith doesn't work that way, does it? We need to live with vigilance, with boldness all the time. And I see, if I kind of see that my birthright is taken and I'm kind of acquiescing to somebody else, that's inconsistent with all the language we just used, right? All the verses that we just saw, the apathy of Israel, their unwillingness to take their place, their unwillingness to be bold, their unwillingness to take the kingdom as their own. It leads to apathy, doesn't it? I'm just going to wait. Someday I'll be dead. Jesus says that's not how the kingdom is possessed. We've already identified the rule and the reign of the kingdom as the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. I don't inhabit the kingdom as a person of faith. I'm not a part of the, part of the kingdom because I'm just a Christian. I'm a part of the kingdom because the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ is established through and in me. Do you see that? In other words, I am taking a back seat to nobody. Jesus 
disciples at one point said, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? His response was this, you don't have any clue what you're talking about. You don't understand the kingdom. I'm not willing to give up my authority that Jesus gave me. I'm not going to give it up. There's a story that we all know pretty well of Jacob and Esau. Jacob was one of the great patriarchs. And Esau, J- Jacob was a farmer. Jacob kind of tended the house. Esau was a great hunter. He was out in the fields. Esau comes in from the field, and Jacob had made some food. And Esau said, give me that food. Jacob, who was a manipulator, he said, sell me your birthright. Esau said, what good is my birthright? I'm going to die. So he sold him his birthright. Esau wept the whole rest of his life and lamented the fact that he'd given up his birthright. And my conviction is this. Whatever you believe about it, whatever you believe about this, do not give up your inheritance. Don't take a back seat. Don't say I'm not involved. We take the kingdom by force. We don't wait for it to happen. If God repopulates native Israel, fine. If God rebuilds the temple, fine. But if God has said that my that I'm his temple, why is he rebuilding the old one? Is God a temple? Am I a temple for God only for Christian people, but not for Jewish people? Do they need a second temple because they're not temple enough? Is God transient? He can't quite figure out where he wants to dwell. Do we really need to reinstitute temple worship when all of the patriarchs or all of the apostolic fathers condemned it? When Peter himself said, why would we place a burden on these Gentiles that we ourselves were unable to bear? Are the Jewish people somehow going to be able to to bear it again? I don't think so. If you do, fine. Not a deal breaker. But whatever you do, don't give up our inheritance. Don't take a back seat. Take the kingdom by force. Grab it. And don't let go of it. You got it? Fair enough? Go enjoy that hot, humid weather. <laughs>